that you are here today, whether you are joining us via the live stream or you are in, here in person. I, my name is Pastor Lauren. Pastor John and I are glad that you are here as we prepare to have a time of worship together this morning. We invite you to check out this video. <laughs> Money is a necessary part of our lives. With it, we buy food and clothing, we pay our bills, and we spend it in countless other ways. But when the Bible looks at how we spend our money, it skips right past these spending habits and looks instead at our hearts. In Matthew 6.21, Jesus tells us that our hearts belong to the thing we treasure most. He then warns us that it is not possible to serve both God and money. This is why it is important to take time and reflect on what the top priority in our hearts is. So let's look at three questions we can reflect on to ground ourselves in the Bible and really take an honest look at who or what our hearts are serving. First, what does my spending say about what makes me most happy? We all spend our money on whatever we think will bring us the most joy. This means that if our joy is really coming from God, then our spending will show it. But if other things have stolen our heart, we'll find that we have few resources left over for helping the cause of the gospel. Number two, does my spending suggest I'm collecting for this life? The Bible often reminds us that we should store our treasure in heaven where it will never be lost. So when we're tempted to collect for a few short decades here, we need to be reminded that only money invested in the kingdom of God will last. And number three, is my spending explicitly supporting the spread of the gospel? Jesus is coming back, and if we truly believe this, we will do everything we can to see our friends and family come to know Him. We can't buy conversions, but a generous heart can be a powerful example of how our trust is in God and not our money. And oftentimes, this kind of generosity can open the door to Christ-centered conversations that we never thought possible. No one is going to be perfect when it comes to managing money. But when God is truly at the center of our oh, hearts, care. instead of the desire for more money, we'll be happier and more generous because our hope is secure in Him. Amen. Our hope is secure in Jesus Christ. Let's stand up this morning and worship Him. You guys ready to worship this morning? Amen. Here we go. Your love awakens me. Shout it out, your love, cause your love 
understand his love when you realized your need of salvation what an amazing love that we have there's nothing that could compare to the love of God there's no greater cost that has been paid than what was paid for our salvation but this world will try to pull us away from our devotion to God first John 2 15 and 16 says do not love the world or the things in the world if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. There is nothing in this world that could compare to how great our God is. What a beautiful name he has. Amen. There's 10,000 reasons is the name of this next song. And when I think about being able to praise God, we can never praise Him enough. Amen.
you this morning. What a beautiful name. You're so awesome. You're so faithful, God. Our Savior, there's nothing that compares to you. We want to worship you. You were the word at the beginning, one with God. There's no name like your name. 
Help us, Lord, this morning as we hear the word, God. Let us not disregard it. Let us not just hear it and let it pass, God. May we apply it to our lives, God, because we need you so much. May our, each heart here this morning be touched. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go ahead and be seated. We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning in lieu of having a time of announcements and updates on things our executive director kelly is going to come and give his quarterly executive director report <laughs> Go get him, buddy. all right good morning so i'm going to go over a brief snapshot of where we are where we stand today some of our accomplishments in the past and what we're looking forward to doing in the future as well. Now this is the uh, essentially the same report I gave at the church conference. So if you were at the church conference, already heard it, I apologize, but I think it's important information to uh, give to everybody. So we're gonna jump right into the finances. And we're looking at that top bar there for the 620,000. That is what we expected to receive through the month of September. Now realize we reduced our budget considerably for this year because of lower giving levels too. So it was already reduced about eight and a half percent. We expected to have 620,000. You can see through September, the actual giving level is much less than that. It's only 552,000. So it's about over $67,000 less than we expected. So what do you do when you're not making as much money? Well, you don't spend as much money. And so that's what we've done. That third line is how much we've actually spent through September. So you can see we're managing the money that we have coming in. We've done that by implementing real cost controls, keeping some positions vacant and doing whatever we can to control expenses. Now I do want to point out that we are behind in our apportionments too. And that's that's a goal. We always want to be able to pay 100% of apportionments. We are a connectional church. So our goal is to make that up by the end of the year. But the only way we can pay full apportionments is to keep those expenses down and have giving go up these past two months. So that's what we're hoping to have happen. So let's move on and look at uh, some of our accomplishments. One of the concerns has always been our communications. And over the past year, we have made a lot of improvements there. We launched a new website in January. It has all updated information. If you go on there, you can listen to all the latest sermons. There are now links to uh, Google. So if you don't have a Facebook account, you can still listen to them. We have the Chimes newsletters for the entire year. We have all the leadership team reports, upcoming events. There's a lot of good information on that website. We've also expanded our social media presence to add Twitter and Instagram as well as Facebook. And of course, enhanced communications too. You may have noticed the new Chimes is out. So we've been trying to get the Chimes out. It's in color. It's We're sending it uh, through electronic communications. We're also email or mailing it to the homebound as well. So we made a lot of improvements for our communications. Now let's talk a little bit about what's going on. Uh, there's also been concerns about the youth program. We have built a larger expanded youth room by taking two rooms and making it into one large room. We've also worked on the outdoor youth facilities as well. We've got a fire pit there, We're working on a gaga ball pit, a uh, volleyball court, maybe even a movie screen. Sunday nights have been very successful. We've had as many as 25, 30 youth out there. So the youth program is expanding. So that's really good news for the youth. Uh, administratively, we've been doing this probably stuff you don't really see, but behind the scenes, we've been realigning a lot of the responsibilities, restructuring staff, and realized a lot of savings from there as well. We do have a new net membership database so we can do, give better reports. Uh, eventually, the congregation will be on that, be allowed to access that database so you can use it as a directory. You can find out what's going on with small groups, upcoming events as well. We've had a lot of improvements in the AV. You probably notice on the screens outside give a lot more information than they used to. Uh, one of the concerns for live stream, something was that they asked a lot is, can we sh show what's on the TV screens on the live stream? We now do that. Uh, as far as the sound, definitely been improvements in the sound. The choir used to sit back there when the sermon was going on. All they would see is the back of the head, right? They don't see what you're seeing. And the sound, too, the speakers coming out here, so they couldn't really hear. They now have a TV screen that where they can see what you guys are seeing and also have better sound equipment so they can actually hear. So we heard that concern. We did something about that. Another concern, too, was security in preschool. So we've added two new security cameras in preschool, so now they can see anybody coming down the stairs through that door. 
our hope is to expand the security uh, as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Now we'll talk about our facilities needs. We do have a very good facilities team. They probably saved us tens of thousand dollars in the little fixes they have done throughout the year and we're very appreciative of that. But we have some really big ticket items that need to be taken care of as well. Uh, one of the top on the priority list is the window frames need to be either repainted or wrapped. The cost estimated maybe twenty-five, twenty-six thousand dollars to paint. If we wrap them, it's going to be more expensive, be more of a permanent solution. Uh, roof repairs, we have a number of shingles that are missing, so we'll need to get that repaired before we end up with water damage too. That could be, uh, we're not sure the cost, maybe up to $40,000. New playground, our playground is in pretty rough shape now. All the equipment really needs to be replaced, so we're looking to replace that as well. The cost for that could be anywhere from twenty-five to $70,000 or more, depending on how large we make it. HVAC repairs, all of our HVAC units are pretty much at the end of their life expectancy. Uh, repairing them would probably cost three, dollars $4,000 each replacement, and they, a lot of them really need to be replaced at this point, would be about ten to 12000 We have 13 HVAC units, so that, that's a lot of money right there. And security improvements, too, in this day and age, we'd certainly like to improve security. We'd love, I'd love to have cameras in every hallway, love to change the uh, rekey, the exterior doors, and get like a key card where we can control the access. But again, that's going to cost a lot of money. So where are we going to get this money? That, that's the big question. You can already see the giving is down. So what we're, the leadership team has talked about this a lot. What we've decided to do is we're going to send a letter to all the donors of the new building fund. And we're going to thank them for their donations, but also give them the opportunity to give part or all of their donation towards capital improvements so we can take care of this. And the idea is that it, it doesn't make any sense to be talking about building a new building when we have so many needs for our current building. Let's take care of our current structure first before we talk about a new building. So that's just a quick snapshot of what's going on. So thank you very much. Please pray with me. Lord, thank you for allowing us to wake up with the extra hour of sleep into this beautiful sunshine that you are filling the earth with. Thank you for the joy of fellowship with friends and family and the excitement of another new day, another new season, and the cold weather for those who really enjoy it. As we move into this topic of money, Lord, I pray you be with our pastors, John and Lauren, as they bring a most difficult message. Open our ears, our mind, and our hearts as we try to figure out what we can do with what you give us, giving that money back to you in your service, may we please pray earnestly amongst ourselves. Lord, thank you again for bringing us together. Amen. Please stand with me while we read from the Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Kim, thank you very much for reading scripture for us this morning. All of one verse. It's not too often, just to let you know that Pastor Lauren and I only choose one verse. But we are grateful to share that today because this is a hard message. Money. Oh, yeah. We like money, don't we? We like it a whole lot. As a matter of fact, we like spending it. We like earning it. We like spending it some more. Giving it. Eh, that's where the rubber meets the road. And guess what we're going to be talking about today? Giving money. That's right. This is a powerful message, and my hope is that we can grapple with this, not just today, but guess what? You get four weeks. Yeah, come on, give me some amens. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing, yeah. In your heart, you're probably like, are you kidding me, seriously? So today we begin this sermon series about first mile and second mile giving. And the way that we are want to differentiate the two is first mile giving is about tithing. So when you, these, these um, 
I always want to say plates, but when these bowls get passed around a little bit, that money goes into the use of this church to make this church function. The second mile giving we'll be talking about on the fourth week talks about all the stuff on top of that. All the things that are on top of all the making this happen. Ministry and mission, not only around this place called Culpeper, but around the world. So before we dive into more of that, I want to talk a little bit about money, my personal experience with money. So money, some of you know, and many of you know that I like to exercise. And I go out three days a week and I go to Rockwater Park right across the way. And it's a beautiful place to be, let me tell you. Not only because of the proximity, but also all the things they've got on over there, whether there's those trails. Now they've expanded those trails. I haven't checked out the expansion yet. But then they've got this Ninja Warrior course. I'm a huge fan. Huge fan. And so the Lord has helped open my eyes to the importance of taking care of my physical body. But let me tell you, it is a gift in many other ways as well. Not just taking care of my physical, but spiritually, emotionally, it is a huge thing. Just about a month ago, I found out also it's financially beneficial. Because as I was jogging along this trail with my dog, guess what I find? Money. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I need to borrow some money from somebody, as a matter of fact. I need a dollar bill. Anybody got a dollar bill in their pocket? Come on, dollar bill. Anybody? All right, here we go. Sweet. Look at this. Somebody just willingly gave me their dollar bill, not knowing what's going to happen with it. (laughs) This dollar bill wasn't this room in particular. It was laying in the grass at Rockwater Park. And I was just jogging along, doing my thing, and guess what I see? It's laying there. What? (laughs) Now, I'm not so sure about you. If you see money laying in the grass, what are you going to do? You're just going to keep jogging by? (laughs) Nobody's around. Man, there was excitement in my heart and in my mind. Now, we're talking about a dollar. It was not a $20 bill. There was no other money that was wrapped in it, at least when I opened initially, what I was initially thinking. I said, there's a dollar. All kinds of things are running in my mind. And again, this is about three seconds. Man, I got a, oh, there's money right there. That's going to be my money. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put that in my pocket. There's nobody around. What can I do with that dollar? I'll tell you, I'm going to put it in my pocket. That's what I'm going to do. So sure enough, that's what I did. I grabbed up that money, and I kept going. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's somebody up ahead. They had just passed this road. Maybe that money is theirs. And also, there's some workers out there. They were making that new bridge, that expansion that goes out to farming in Farmington Elementary. And they were making that, and I was like, maybe it's some of the workers. Maybe they dropped it. So I keep jogging up there. What am I going to do? Am I going to say anything? All right, I got to say something. I stop with the dog. Anybody lose their money? I got a dollar. Anybody lose their money? <laughs> nope. One of the workers actually made a comment about that. Pretty much he doesn't carry cash. I was like, oh, guess what I did? (laughs) I put that right back in my pocket, and I keep going. Man, this is a good day. You go to Rockwater Park, I get physically active, I get help in my emotions and my spirit, and I'm making money. (laughs) It's all of a dollar. It's all of a dollar. And man, I'm excited. Money has a hold on me. Because quite often I realize, well, how am I going to use that dollar now? Hmm, let's see. I'm just going to save it. It's going to get tucked away. It's going to get saved. Now, what about you? When you see money laying on the ground, And you snatch it up. Are you asking anybody else about, is this your money? Did you lose this money? Is this your money? Or are you just keeping it to yourself? You see, money has a hold on me. Does it have a hold on you? 
because money is something that can use me. Where it's supposed to be the opposite way around. I'm the one supposed to be using the money, but far too often I find money using me. What about you? You see, that's the dilemma that Jesus is lifting up here in this one verse. In this place called the Sermon on the Mount that goes from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about some important things. And we've talked about some of those things previously, about prayer and fasting. And then Jesus all of a sudden talks about money. He's like, okay, wait a minute. Now you're stepping on my toes, Jesus. Now you're talking about money. Guess who decides about how to spend my money? Me. You don't, get to, you don't get to do that, Jesus. Jesus is saying, guess what, folks? You get a choice. John, you get a choice. Which one are you going to serve? Which one are you going to use? Are you going to serve God? Are you going to serve me, John, says Jesus? Or are you going to serve money? Are you going to let money be your master? Now, overall, it sounds silly when we say money is my master. I don't have no masters, we say. But Jesus is saying, guess what? You have a master whether you realize it or not. And you got to choose. And every day we choose how to spend money, how to use money. Do you realize that every day you spend money, some way, somehow, whether you're paying a mortgage or you're paying rent, whether you're paying heat or air conditioning, whether you're buying food or paying for food or receiving food, money is spent somehow, some way, every day. How are you using it? Or is it being used by you? Are you, you, are you getting used by money? Is, mas- is, the, is money your master or is money your servant? Money makes an excellent servant, but it makes a horrible master. Jesus, you see, realized that, and that's why he's lifting this up. He said, folks, let me tell you, this is an either or. It's not a both and. It's not a, well, you can, you, can, uh, you can hedge your bets and you can say, well, one day I'll serve you, God. The next day I'm going for the money. And then the next day I'll go back to you, God. This is a struggle, a real struggle that needs to take place every day where we need to say, God, you, you are the one who is the master of my life. And if Jesus is Lord... That means money cannot be Lord. And yet I struggle with that. What about you? I'm going to give you your money back. There's this guy named John Wesley. Anybody heard of him? This guy named John Wesley helped us understand a lot about our faith. And one of the things that he helped us understand is the use of money. There's a sermon that he has out there called The Use of Money. How many people have read that sermon? Oh, yeah, three of us. <laughs> and guess what? Those three are pastors. <laughs> and I'm sorry to say that, but we need to read some more of John Wesley. In this sermon of John Wesley called The Use of Money, there are three things that he talks about money that he highlights. That we need to gain all that we can. And there's stipulations to those gaining. Not so, 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 wow, let me start over again. Not hurting ourselves, not hurting others, for example, of gaining all you can. You need to save all you can. And man, those those sound good, don't they? I'll make that happen. I'll go headlong into those things. Then there's a third one. And he was writing this sermon because he realized the people of his day in the 1700s, struggled this as well the third one is what is it give Give all you can 
Gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. All three of those need to be held in tight formation. You can't just leave one to the side. You can't just say, well, those first two sound good. The third one, eh, that e. When you're telling me about giving, that's not how that works. I mean, I give when I want to give. I give when I can give, which isn't that often. Because I really can't give. And there we get to the crux of the matter. Can we give? You see, there's another book that I've been reading. It's called Passing the Plate. Why American Christians Don't Give Away More Money. Man, doesn't that sound like a riveting book? (laughs) It's a little dry, I guarantee it. But there's some valuable lessons that I want to point out to you in here. Some of those lessons say this. We talk about those word, that word tithing. What does tithing mean? Giving what? Giving money 10% of our income. 10%. All right? Are you still with me or are you glazing eyes? 10% of our income is what we're talking about here. And it's a biblical thing throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, Jesus refers to this thing called tithing. This book says, even though we may talk about tithing in church of 10% of our income, guess how much on average people give? Man, we got some geniuses here. In between 2 and 3% is what people give. In between 2 and 3%. Now, there's all kinds of statistics in here. And, oh, my goodness, it can, be, it can be hurting to read, try and read some of this stuff. And I'm a math minor, by the way. And for me, I'm just like, oh, my goodness. But between 2 and 3% of our income goes to the church of tithing. So the tithing started at 10%, and now all of a sudden it says, well, if you're more comfortable with 2 or 3, let's just stay there. What this book also wrestled with is why. Why is that the case? We in the United States of America live in the most wealthy country in the world. We live in the most wealthy country in the world of any time ever. There are some incredible things that we do as a church and as a nation to help others. Incredible. But this book lifts up the reality if, if we actually began to tithe. Now, again, this is a big if, a big if. I'm trying to write out IF. A big if. If we did that, there would be anywhere from 46 to upward of $100 billion extra a year. Now that's B, that's billion with a B. 46 to upwards of 100 plus billion dollars a year. Oh my goodness. You want to talk about air conditioners? No problem. We got some of that. You want to talk about a roof? We got that. You want to talk about a playground? Oh yeah. We got that too. Instead, typically when we hear these figures and we say it's going to cost 40000 maybe, we're not sure, for the roof. If we want a new playground, if we expand the playground, after all, it is a little small, just saying. If we expanded this, we're talking about forty to seventy, dollars $100,000. <gasps> Why would we spend money on that? Do the kids matter? Does the community matter? matter? Does the invitation that we can bring to say, we want your kids to be over there in that space? Do you like to be warm? Do you like to have air conditioning? I'm spoiled. I like to have it. And when I don't, oh my goodness. The spending of money, the consumeristic 
mentality that we have in our world and our culture is what drives us. So when you see that dollar on the ground, even though it's a dollar, if it was bigger than a dollar, you would go all kinds of things. If your mind is like mine, you would say, man, I know exactly what I'm going to spend that on. I got a new book I need to get. I got some new shoes I'm going to need to get. I got some can Okay, I don't need shoes. <laughs> Maybe you guys do. I got some candy I want to buy. I got this, I got that. I want this, this, that. There's all kinds of possibilities. In this book, Passing the Plate, there's several quotes that I want to read for you. It says about this power of money that it has over us. So if I can flip to the right page here, listen to these words. On page 194 of this book, it says this. Yet another sociological insight that we can deduce from the analysis of this book is that all social orders, even allegedly secular ones, are ultimately built on sacred objects of worship and reverence. The sacred element of human social life was a theme highlighted by an important early 20th century French sociologist named Emile Durkheim. Even today we can see that his theory is illuminating. No human society, it turns out, operates in no human society, it turns out, operates in, on, and with that which is purely mundane and profane. Somewhere in every society, there are objects that are held to be sacred and so revered, defended, protected, worshipped, and honored by its members. In some societies, dead ancestors or emperors or ethnicity are sacred. In American society, we surmise from this book study, it is money and individual autonomy that are sacred, perhaps even more sacred than even God church, the gospel, and the Bible for some American Christians. By virtue, by, by virtue of being sacred in American culture, it is nearly impossible to question, to infringe upon money and individual autonomy. Woo! What are they saying there? Can anybody give me the English there? That's just part of the dryness of this book. It's my money, it's none of your business. That sounds like a great summary. I get to spend my money where I want to spend my money. This is my money. I earned it. I got the right to decide how to spend it, how to use it. Man, that sounds good, doesn't it? Sadly, we worship a God who says otherwise. We worship a God who says, guess what? I do care how you spend your money. I do care how you actually see your money. Money is not your God, says Jesus. And you're treating it like that. Money is not your God, but you're treating it like that. Because we need money to survive. There's no doubt about it. But you see, we believe we need money for our security. And we need money for all the other things that are going on, but that is replacing God. God is the only one who can keep us secure. God is the only one that holds us in the palm of his hands and says, I'm going to take care of you. You see, that's the later part of these verses that we didn't read for you here in chapter 6 of Matthew. Where Jesus is talking about the clothes that you wear and the food that you eat and the shelter that you have. Don't worry about those things don't worry about them says jesus and yet me oh my i'm a little worried about those things As a matter of fact i got a family of five there's five of us that i doubt that we don't need to take care of i want to make sure we got food clothing and shelter what about you you like to have those things taken care of jesus is saying all those things require money And yet don't worry about them. How can we not worry about them? First and foremost, God. God needs to be first. We need to be worshiping God and not money. And when we put that in proper perspective, all of a sudden things will take a whole different shift, a whole different outlook. And my hope is that we can begin to better understand what it means to earn all that we can, not simply so we can hoard it, so we can use it for my gifts 
my things that I want. After all, I do need more shoes, right? I'm still looking to give away the other pair. So we can save some of that money, but we need to give it away. We got to give it away. And when we begin, begin to give it away, that, that tight fist that we have, that tight fist that we have on money begins to open a little bit. But it takes time to figure that out. You see, this is like a spiritual discipline. It is a spiritual discipline like the other ones we've talked about before. So when you think you can say, oh, yeah, I can, oh, uh, no, I'm not going to try that. That's ridiculous, Pastor John. Pastor Lauren, you may be talking about the same thing, but I don't think so. I can't do it. I'm not interested in doing it. I'm not going to do it. You see, that's another what they talk about. Over half of the people said, if requiring people to tithe in church, wait a minute, let me say that again. If you wanted to come to church and you want to be a member of the church and we required you to tithe, guess what? Half, the, over half the people said, I wouldn't do it. I ain't signing on. As a matter of fact, I'm going to find a different church. Now, I'm here to say I'm not going to require you to tithe. But I want to require you to pray. When is the last time you prayed about the money that you give to the church? When is the last time you talked to the Lord to say, Lord, I really struggle with money. It's got a hold on me. Help me to give it away or give me a desire to give it away because I struggle with that. When's the last time you had such a conversation? That's what I want to require of you. Because if you don't tithe, I want you to struggle with saying, why should I? And maybe where, where is there a starting point in my life where I can say, well, let me start with this. Let me start with that 2% perhaps and build from there. And when you do, when you do, let me tell you what's not going to happen. The prosperity gospel will say you will be blessed in abundance and you will receive more upon more upon more because you give. I'm here to tell you that ain't going to happen. That ain't how it works. We give because Jesus told us to. We give to support God's kingdom and not our own. And so God will do that money, what God wants to do. But let me tell you, you will be changed. You will be transformed because money will take a different perspective. It will become a wonderful servant instead of a horrible master. And so perhaps when you see that money that's laying there on the ground, you say, man, that's a $20 bill, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's fake. Oh. Or if you see some real money on there and you're trying to figure out what am I going to do with it, maybe instead of just pocketing it and you can say, I got plans for this, maybe you can start thinking about how I can give it away. Maybe you can say, this is not even my money to begin with. How can I make sure that others receive it? You see, a tithe sounds good when you got this much money, doesn't it? If you got a dollar in your pocket, or you found that dollar, how much of a tithe is this? Ten cents, man, that's easy money. I can give ten cents, no problem. And then you start working a real job. Then you start getting paid a little bit more. And thousands of dollars begin coming into your bank account, into your thing, wherever you keep it. Maybe it's not a bank account. Maybe it's your mattress. But thousands of dollars begin coming into this, and they're all like, uh, that, I mean, hmm. I mean, if I'm making 50 grand a year, what is 10% of that? Oh, I can't do that. That's way too much. Ten cents I can give. Five thousand? No, 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 no. 
it seems like the more capacity that we have, the more earning that we have, the more capacity we have to give. But this book tells us separate. It tells us differently. It tells us that actually the more money that we make, the less likely we are to give. Oh, my. And yet we in the United States of America are the most wealthy country in the world. And yeah, we help, we help folks. The church does incredible work, not just United Methodist Church around the world, but the church as a broad church, the universal church, does incredible stuff for people. But what if, what if if we seriously began to wrestle with this thing called a tithe? What would God do, not only in the world, but what, God, what would God do in your heart? What would God do in your mind to say, I'm no longer a slave to my money. I'm no longer so worried about how this is going to work. All of a sudden, God begins to take over more, and God says, I got you. I got you. Now let me be careful here. We need to use our minds. We have to be smart with money. We cannot just say, well, I got a $2,000 paycheck. I might as well just go ahead and give it away right now. We have to make sure to take care of our family. We have to make sure to take care of our own, if you will. The trouble is, is what does it mean to take care of our family? After all, there's, I mean, there's like new iPhones out now. You've seen those things? They got like three cameras on there. I mean, come on, you got to have one of those. I mean, they got these things that are these TVs now. It's better than 4K. It's like, I don't know how many K. You got to have one of those. Time and time again, there's always something else that we are told we need. What are you needing now? Maybe there's something in your list of needs. And let me tell you, it costs not just a few dollars. It costs thousands of dollars. There's one other quote in this book that talks about when we get tied up in our houses and our cars, the two most expensive things we have in our lives, we tie up a tremendous amount of money there. And then we say, well, I'm broke. I'm house broke and I'm car broke. Guess who made those decisions to purchase that? I did. You did. We have to be prayerful in the ways that we use money. Don't let it. Don't let it be your master. Don't let it be your master. There is one Lord that we have, and his name is Jesus. And my hope is that you wrestle with that reality and what that means for your life, because I know I'm doing the same. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, not money. Amen and amen. Friends, to the communion table, Christ invites all of us, all of us who earnestly love God, who repent of our sin, and who are trying our very hardest to live at peace with God and also with one another. 
will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, God, we come before you today as people who have tried hard to love you and to put you first in our lives, but also as people who have failed. God, as each and every one of us continues uh, to need your grace and to need your mercy in big and in new ways every single day. God, there are different ways that we may have failed. God, some of us uh, struggle. We struggle with what our priority is, struggle with what it is that we are putting first in our life. God, sometimes we get it right and we put you first, but a lot of times we don't. God, now in a time of silence, we offer our personal confessions to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you, you are, are forgiven. forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. We worship an awesome God who knows that we will fail and have failed, but it's not just the knowing that we recognize. We recognize this God who says, I forgive you. You are welcome into my presence and I need you to be here with me. This is that table where we recognize that Christ gathered his disciples together on that wonderful time together, but also horrible time together, that last supper, where he transformed that thing called the Passover meal that celebrates this wonderful God who brought the people out of slavery and bondage. Jesus says that, that is me. I am that God who helped provide all of those things, salvation through those waters at the Red Sea. Now I'm provide a different kind of salvation for you. I'm going to die for you on the cross. I'm going to die for you. That's the sacrifice the Lord was willing to give for you and for me. Knowing that we had failed, knowing that we had fallen short, the Lord says, come, come back. This is the table of grace where we are reminded that we do not earn grace, we do not even, uh, we don't earn it, or we don't deserve it, is what I'm trying to say. But we all need it. All of us are in, needs of God, in need of God's grace. So this place, as we recognize the importance of this meal that's here before us, that God is present here in a special and significant way in these simple elements of bread and juice. And as we take these things, the body of Christ and the blood of Christ, and we ingest them into us, we too can be transformed to be more fully Jesus' disciples. As we struggle in particular this month about money and what that struggle is for us and for me, how we need to make sure that Jesus is our master and not money. This is the place to do that. This is the place to earnestly come before the Lord to say, I've failed. Help me to do this better. Help me to follow you more closely. Help me to be your disciple, oh God. Help me to do that today. Help me to do that today. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, pour out yourself upon us, all those who gathered here today, and on these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine. Help them be for us, oh God. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. We need you, O oh God. This world so desperately needs you. And so help us to be those persons, to be those disciples you have called us to be. And one in ministry to the church and one in ministry to all the world, O oh God. You have called us to faithfully act as your representatives in this place. Your world, your beautiful world you have created. This beautiful world that you died to redeem, to provide healing, hope, and reconciliation. Help us, O oh God to be that, to be that body that provides those things so that others see you in us. In your holy name we pray, amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you.
I want to invite those who are going to be helping to come forward. At this point, I also want to let you know that this is Christ's table, so you don't have to be a member of this church or a member of this denomination. You simply have to accept the invitation that Christ gives. And Christ says, all those who, who, who repent of their sin, all those who love Jesus and desire to love their neighbors, if you, in, if you are accepting of that invitation, you are welcome to come. You will be coming down the middle aisle. There will be several stations down here. We will ask you to hold your hands out in a cup fashion to recognize that we receive grace. We don't take it. We recognize this God who says, I'm giving it to you freely. And we recognize also there is gluten as a complication for many people's lives. So if gluten is a complication, there will be a station in the middle for you. Please come and receive that station here as well. Come, our helpers, come. in love price of life's demand shameful sin placed on him the hope of every man though the blood of Jesus washes
time when my husband had lost his job and we were called to still tithe that 10% even then and money just showed up out of nowhere. A check in the mail, a refund we weren't expecting because that's the God we serve. He takes care of our needs. Amen. Malachi 3.10 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not be able to contain it. That's the God we serve. And ultimately, he's inviting this morning, us this morning, to see our need of him. We need that so much more than anything else in this world. Amen. Give us Jesus. preacher preached a little too long today, but we are not going to leave out this place. This time of remembrance today is All Saints Sunday. And so in the remembrance of All Saints Sunday, there are 63 names that we're going to be reading today. We have asked you as a community to give us names that have, of those, their loved ones, friends that have died this past year. And we have 63 names. And so what we're going to do, Pastor Lauren and I are going to read three names and there will be a chime and then we'll read three names. There'll be another chime until we get through those 63. So today, today we remember all those who have gone before us, recognizing that God is with them, 
recognizing God is with us because nothing, nothing separates us from the love of Christ. Nothing, not even death. So we come. We come today in prayer. Shall we pray? Holy God, we come and we give you thanks that nothing can separate us from your love. We are so grateful for the names of these people that we are lifting up today. We are so grateful for this time of worship as we recognize, oh God, that we are not alone. That we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses. And just 63 of these names, oh God, we lift up before you today. For no matter Forma Anderson, Apari by Ray Bull. Phil Blaine Sr. Dick Bilicic. Gladys Bowie. Scott Bywaters. Wesley G. Chubb. Diane Clark. Betty Collins. Dorothy Hare Connolly. Iris Corbin. Zelma Covington, Doris K. Dennis, Ken Dotson. Trula Ensley, Upton Fairfax, Shelva Fairfax. Buddy Fant, Paige Farmer, Marjorie Fitzgerald. Jill Hall, Miriam Mo Halsey, Gail Hare. Julianne Holt, Carl Hurley, Virginia Hurley. John Eiler, Wilmer Robert Jenkins, Mary Jenkins. Golly John, Kay Joseph, Madeline Kennedy. Robertson Kennedy, J.F. Kratchevich, Pat Kilby. Charlotte Larson, Bobby Lillard, Mike McLaughlin. Karen Millam, Ron Miller, Josie Lax Mills. Ann Moss, Sarah Payne, Ian Phillips. M. P. Thaventhoth, K. Chandler Rao, Rachel Rogers. Richard Rummel, Shirley Schrage, Sean Scott. Roger Smith, George Werner Stredner, George Everett Taylor. Edith Thomas, Gloria Thomas, Harding Thomas. Ronald Thomason, Margaret Treslow, Lewis West. Butch West, Kim Wilson, Charlie George Yeager. Holy God, we are blessed to hear these names. We are blessed to hear these chimes as we remember not only these people, but we remember you embracing them. We remember you embracing us in the midst of our loss. Help us, O oh God, in this grief process, in this grief journey, to hold on to you more tightly today than we have before. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord ushers, please come forward. We'll sing the chorus where I stand and sing, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've given us our free will to choose who will be the master of our life. And Father, as today, me and my household choose you. Father, my prayer is everyone would choose you above everything else in their life so that they may see the love that you have and this grace and mercy that pours out from you into their lives so they can see this loving Father who wishes and desires to have a relationship with everyone who comes into his life. So, Father, thank you. Now, bless these gifts so that we may do your work here in this world. So, Father, we can give you away to others so that people will see your son gave everything for us to be in relationship. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. some money as a reminder for this month for this time I want you to put this money someplace where you say Lord help me to wrestle with this money the money that you give me to do your work help me so if you desire to wrestle with that if you desire a piece of money I got some for you there are no bills here though but God God is working in your heart and mind to transform it so that God's kingdom can be built and not our own. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.